Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at First Christian Church. My name is Tommy Cook, and I'm so glad to welcome each and every one of you here, both of you who are here in the sanctuary with us and for those of you worshiping online. We are glad that you've joined us, and I invite you to stand and join with us for a couple of songs. Still pretty new to us. We introduced it last week, and so we're still in the process of learning it. We've got Maggie and Clara who are going to help us uh, lead the songs today. So, girls, thank you for being here and helping us out. Yeah. And uh, if you don't know the song, just learn it with us. And if you know it already, sing out nice and strong. Two. 
You all help. Will the girls help me do the children's blessing today? Are you up for that? All right. So this is the blessing that we offer every single week. We say it together, both for our children who are with us and those who are worshiping online and everywhere so that they know how much they are loved. So let's say it together. May you, May you always know, know how, how much, much God, God loves, loves you and claims you. May you May always know how much we love you and claim you as our own. And may you return to teach us about the realm of God as only children can do. All right, I think Albert's there, ready for you. And so all the parents know as the summer continues, we will be having our young people staying up here with us. And so every Sunday after worship, you will be able to find them up, up here um, so you don't have to go around the building looking for them. They'll be here for you. I'll be here for you. Please join me in this morning's opening prayer, followed by our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God of all things small and big, be with us in this space as we worship and spread your spirit to each person. Give each what they need this morning, courage, grace, forgiveness, strength, peace, healing, faith. Pour into us your divine love as we pour out your praise and gratitude for you and the gift of your son, Jesus, who always worked one person at a time, meeting needs. He taught that with only a little miraculous, things can still happen. May we pray together the Lord's Prayer with hope in our hearts. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is your opportunity every week to check in, to share any prayer requests, and to greet your neighbor as we prepare for the rest of worship. Greetings. I brought my coffee. You never know, Amanda. Hi, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Jerry McBroom, and I'm the Minister of Engagement and Outreach here at FCC. Our world moves fast. But I want to remind you of something amazingly amazing we did together recently. Free your minds, travel back in time with me, to Lent 2024. Our theme for Lent was Wandering Hearts, 
and in partnership with Kentucky Refugee Ministries, we decided to host a school supplies drive for refugee children and their families. School supplies are necessary and expensive and something that some refugee and immigrant families struggle to provide for their children. We felt like we could help. We had an ambitious goal to provide 40 refugee families with 40 backpacks filled with necessary school supplies. Friends, I am thrilled to report that we blew past that goal. Our church raised over $4,000 to provide 65 refugee children and their families with backpacks full of school supplies for the upcoming school year this fall. So, two weeks from today, on Sunday, June the 23rd, from 1.30 to 3, our church gets to complete the circle by going to Kentucky Refugee Ministries to learn about the ways that Kentucky Refugee Ministries serves our community. We get to tour the facility, and we'll serve together by stuffing backpacks with school supplies and putting together hygiene kits for refugee families. You are invited to come along. All are welcome. If you have children, they are welcome. Please let me know if you plan to attend so I can let Kentucky Refugee Ministries know the number of us that will be showing up. So, to recap, because this is all really good stuff. Our church set an ambitious goal to provide 40 refugee children with backpacks packed with school supplies. We blew past that goal to provide families with 65 backpacks packed with school supplies. Two weeks from today, we're going to go to Kentucky Refugee Ministries from 1.30 to 3 o'clock to tour the facility, to get some education about how they impact our community, and to serve by packing uh, backpacks full of school supplies and hygiene kits. If you want to go, please let me know, and I can let them know how many of us are coming. I am so proud and inspired by our congregation and the ways we come together to serve our community. We continue to be a movement for wholeness in this fragmented world. Give with joy knowing that your gifts matter. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunities to partner with you to bring wholeness and healing to our world. May these gifts be multiplied and used in ways that continue to amaze and inspire us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jerry Brooke just agreed to go with me so you can put both of us down. Yeah, all right. I mean, hopefully I was already on the list. <laughs> But add her to your reservations. So, I, oh gosh, you can't see it on the screen. Oh, no, you guys can see it. Good. <laughs> this is a book I'm currently reading right now called Think Red. Imagine your community living and loving like Jesus. And this week I read a chapter called Small Beginnings. And he talks about how even though we live in a world, by the, that we live in the world that lives by the phrase, bigger is better, he points out that Jesus never seemed to care about that. That even when you think about one of his grandest miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, it didn't start that way. It started very small. And when Jesus talked about faith, he didn't say, you need a mountain-sized faith. He said, you need a mustard seed-sized faith. And he usually helped one person at a time. So all of that made me think about the fact that sometimes we forget that Jesus was raised on the same scriptures we are in the first or the Old 
Testament. So he would have been familiar with the way God worked in those stories. He was familiar with the same ones that we've been hearing the last few weeks. He would have known about Hannah praying for Samuel. He would have known of Samuel's call and of last week of David being anointed. And he certainly would have known of our story today, which is the story of David and Goliath. So I read the whole, this is a much longer story. We all think the story's short. It's not. It's very long. I read the whole chapter. I now understand why pastors spend like six weeks just on the story of David and Goliath. I don't have six weeks. I have one. So we're going to have to get focused, y'all. Okay? So we're going to focus on what was the motivation for David's courage and bravery to face such a giant. So I'm going to set the stage. So... Goliath has already come out and made his very scary speech. He said what he's going to do, it's going to be awful, there's going to be destruction, it's terrible. Um, but he's t- what he says is he's going to defy the ranks of Israel. So that's what David hears. He hears that and hears all these challenges. The other thing is he sees all the other soldiers flee in terror. That's scripture quote, not mine. <laughs> flee in terror. And so David wants to know. What's going to be done to, this, to the person who kills this Philistine? His exact words are, the one who dares defy the ranks of the living God. Isn't that an interesting choice? When I start prayers, I often say loving God or grace-filled God or forgiving God. He says living God. He reminds us that we serve and we fight on behalf of a living God. And David ends up being the only person in the whole story to express any kind of faith. Not Saul, not his brothers, not any of the other soldiers, just David is the only one to make this powerfully theological claim about Yahweh. Now, we know that the Philistines also had gods. They're not named in our scriptures. We don't know their names, and there are a lot of them. They needed a bunch for a bunch of different things. A reminder that having one God that covered everything was still a new concept at the time, but it also suggested we had a very powerful God, including one with a name who the ranks of Israel call, like us, Yahweh. So David had asked this question, what's, you know, what does this person who kills Goliath get? And they give an answer. They say the one who defeats Goliath is promised riches and They get the king's daughter, and their family is granted exemption. And even with all of that, they flee in terror. And David doesn't seem all that interested in what it is that they get. But what he's really asking is, why are you afraid when you serve a living God? Not an unnamed God, not a God of many, certainly not a dead God, but a living God. What are you afraid of if you're going to be stepping out on behalf of God? In the face of all these soldiers, in the face of a king, this kid, this, we had learned last week, small person, has a giant size faith, or what Jesus might even call a mustard size faith, seeds worth, compared to everybody else present in the story. And we know why David has this faith. He goes on to explain it to Saul, because he initially volunteers, and Saul's like, nope, no way, that's not going to work. But David tells the story of protecting his sheep, that God delivered David from a bear, and then God delivered David from a lion, in order to protect his sheep. Do you remember where David was last week when everybody was meeting with a powerful priest and a prophet? He wasn't there because he was protecting his sheep. Even in our story, he hasn't abandoned his sheep. He made sure somebody else was watching over them so that he could be bringing food and drink to the soldiers, which is what he was called to do. So his faith is based on his experience. He has faced dangers in order to protect his sheep, and God has delivered him again and again. Now, God didn't part seas for David, but in his everyday 
life, when dangers appeared, serious life-threatening dangers appeared, God delivered him. And that's the word that gets used again and again in the story. His hope and his faith come from his own experience. And it also came from the stories I mentioned. When God delivered Moses and the people, he would have been familiar with those when God set God's people free. So David has faith that God will simply do it again. Because we don't come to church to hear that everything is hopeless. We don't come here to hear that nothing can be fixed or solved or changed or delivered. We come here because, like David, we believe in a living God. We believe in a God who can deliver us. We believe in a God who can set us free like God has done so often before. And not just a living God, but one who we believe is living among us. Who, as we've heard over the last weeks, we believe is still calling us. We believe is asking us to see the way that God sees the world and sees other people. David reminds us, if you're only looking at the giants and what can't be done, when will you have time to look for God who has already overcome Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of giants. They're very big. They're quite scary. We're taking on one of the biggest ones here, which is climate change. But we're trying to face all kinds of problems. What it means to be church in 2024. There are giant-sized problems facing Louisville and our community. How do we fix our buildings so that we can do more ministry that brings wholeness, as Jerry said, to a fragmented world? world that helps us welcome even more people to the Lord's table as God welcomed us? How can we be a place to take on the epic role of relieving loneliness and anxiety that this, in the country that is overrun by it? How do we take on giants? How does David's faith in a living God and a God who delivers help him face what others feared so much, almost too much? I think it takes what Eugene Peterson says, which is a long obedience in the same direction. Even in his very short life, David stayed obedient towards the same God and protected his sheep. Which made me think there's actually a group that meets here regularly uh, that know a lot about a long obedience in the same direction. I don't know if everybody knows this. I know some of you know this, that we host a AA meeting here every week. We used to host it in the community room, uh, but now we actually host it in the sanctuary, which I kind of think is great. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, people who have had serious addictions to alcohol meet here every week in order to stay sober. Talk about defeating a giant with stones. Now, their stones look like coins. There we go. I know that you get one after every month, and I know you get a particular one at the end of a year, and you get a big party at the end of the year. Um, but I learned this week that maybe the most important coin you get is the one you get after staying 24 hours sober. You get it after you take the first step in the right direction. And you get reminded all you have to do is just the next right thing. That's not my spirituality, that's theirs. I'm using their language. And they do it with a power greater than themselves. For them, every day of sobriety is one more day of miracle, of slaying their own giant. David spent a lot of days protecting sheep. <laughs> he had to do it every day. And he learned through day after day after day how to handle predators, how to handle thieves, how to handle wandering sheep, how to handle stubborn sheep. They're not the, you know, sharpest tools in the, <laughs> in the pen, you know. And he practiced by using the tools that he had, which included a slingshot but he also saw with God's eyes and seen the power of the living God deliver him again and again. And he knew about that God because through the stories of how God had delivered God's people 
again and again and again. In part of the story, Saul tries to fit all of his own armor onto David, which of course looks ridiculous and he can't move, but he refuses it. His brothers tried to talk him out of it. They said, the giant's too big, it's too dangerous, you'll never survive, nobody can do it. I don't know if somebody's said those exact words to me about being in church <laughs> lately, but, you know, it's too big, it's too hard. You're going to try to do justice in an unjust world? What? But Jesus doesn't say, fix the whole world tomorrow. <laughs> At no point in the Gospels does he say, fix it all in one fell swoop, right now. And he doesn't model ministry in that way either, at any point. He starts with some fishermen, and he heals one of their mother-in-laws. He starts by going to a wedding and speaking at a synagogue, almost getting stoned, but you know. He told stories about very small seeds and a single coin and a lost sheep. He said, a mustard, size, mustard seed sized faith can move mountains. It might even slay giants. It means looking, no, it means a day at a time. It means staying faithful over and over and over again. Sometimes it's the giants that get you to faith, but oftentimes if you wait for the giant to start these faith practices, you might find out that the house is built on sand and not on stone. My friend Brooke's mom, Mary Jane, has been in AA for decades. And when Brooke died, many of our friends were very nervous about her drinking, that she would break her sobriety. But she and I have talked about it and very bluntly said, she's like, I didn't want to drink. I wanted to die, but I didn't want to drink. She hasn't done either of those things. She's traveled the world. She's won medals in senior Olympics for swimming. She cares for way too many dogs. And she misses her daughter every day. She kept a long obedience in the same direction. And when she was faced with the greatest dev devastation, the giant of her addiction did not prevail. She had already cut off its head. She had already been delivered from her addiction. The word deliver appears the most in the book of Exodus. And there are lots of miracle stories in there. That's where the parting of the seas and stones that produce water, there are pillars of fire and smoke. But if you read all of Exodus, most of the story is about a group of people choosing to walk in the same direction for 40 years, day after day. People of faith overcome giants all the time, even daily, because they continue to believe that despite the challenges, despite others' fear or distrust or doubt, that we believe in a living God, because God has been living with them all along. They already know that God delivers because God has already done it before. You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, David says. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, 
and he will give you into our hand. I don't know if uh, everyone here knows Casey Musgraves. She's a country artist that I love, love, love. And she has a new album out. And I was working one day and I just had it on just to kind of listen to her. And there was this song called The Architect. And it just kind of stopped me in my tracks because I found the words so powerful. And I texted everyone that I know, including Tommy. <laughs> and I was like, this song. Um, so yeah, this is this is the architect. Even something as small as an apple. It's simple and somehow complex. Sweet and divine, the perfect design. Speak to the architect. There's a canyon that cuts through the desert. Did it get there because of a flood? Was it devised or were you surprised when you saw how grand it was? Was it thought out at all or just paint on a wall? Is there any David was probably no older than 16 years old, probably younger than that. And if you thought you were, you had all your scripture for today and you were off the hook for that, I've got some more for you. So track with me. Just let this wash over you as I read this portion of scripture to you. This is also from 1 Samuel 17. A giant stepped out from the Philistine line into the open, Goliath from the Gath. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor. 
126 pounds of it. He wore bronze shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear was like a fence rail. The spear tip alone weighed over 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked ahead of him. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite, Israelite troops, why bother using your whole army? Am I not Philistine enough for you? And you're all committed to Saul, who was their king, aren't you? So pick your best fighter and pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. Give me a man, let us fight it out together. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. I'd forgotten this part. Each morning and evening for 40 days, Goliath took his stand and made his speech. That was the end of the scripture. I'm going to do my thing now. <laughs> David was not old enough to serve in the army of Israel. He was only there because his father sent him to the front lines to check on his brothers and to report back. David volunteers to fight Goliath. At first, King Saul says no. But what choice does he have? A little bit more scripture from 1 Samuel 17. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. David tried to walk but could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And he took it off. Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack. And with his sling in his hand, he approached Goliath. We all know how that story ends. Young, scrawny David, too young to actually serve in the army, too small to wear the armor of battle, yet with one smooth stone, defeats Goliath and wins that battle. Hasn't God always, I'll get through this, hang with me. Hasn't God always used the small, seemingly insignificant to do God's work? A few loaves and fishes to feed the multitude, some mud to heal the eyes of a blind man, a small amount of oil, and flour to, for a widow and her son to eat indefinitely. The grain or the, the faith the size of a mustard seed. An unlikely Messiah. An unlikely Messiah born in the most meager and scandalous circumstances to an unwed teenager. That Messiah uses the ordinary, seemingly insignificant elements of this bread and this cup to teach us about unconditional love, sacrifice, and unity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is with a thankful heart that we come to this table to share the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May it strengthen us through the week as we deal with all that life has in store for us. We are blessed to be able to come and partake in this beautiful ritual. May we never take this for granted. Thank you for all that it brings us. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Then after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sin. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. So as communion is passed to you, you can take the bread when you're ready, but hold the cup to the end and we'll take that together as a sign of our unity. Do you feel small? Do you think you have little to offer? Do you think your faith is too small? Offer yourself anyway. Rejoice and give thanks that you are primed to be used by God in ways you cannot imagine. All are invited to partake of the sacred meal. Amen.
And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Several of us are going to camp from this church uh, this week. I happen to be one of them, and I will be spending a week with a bunch of eighth graders, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's it's great every year. One of the things that I like to do during worship is I like to give them materials and prayers that they can lead and that they can hear uh, sometimes for the first time. And one of those that I, I like to use is actually from... Uh, St. Patrick. So he was a 5th century priest. So we're, we're talking 1,600 years ago, uh, pulling, pulling some resources and some prayers that can help guide us in, in our day at our modern times uh, and be connected to something that's greater and bigger than ourselves. And this is actually a responsive prayer. So I'm going to invite you to respond if you would like. I'll read a line, and then we will respond together. We know that Christ is all around us. And so let's practice that one time. We know that Christ is all around us. And so this is an abridged prayer, abridged version. It's a, it's a rather long prayer, so we're not doing the whole thing. Uh, but it's a, it's a meditation on Christ in our lives, around us, among us, within us. And so I invite you to join me in prayer. Christ be with us, Christ be for us, Christ behind us. We know that Christ is all around us. Christ in us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us. We know that Christ is all around us. Christ on our left, Christ on our right. We know that Christ is all around us. Christ where we lie, Christ where we sit, Christ where we arise. We know that Christ is all around us. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us. We know that Christ is all around us. Christ in every eye that sees us. Christ in every ear that hears us. We know that Christ is all around us. May your salvation, O Lord, be ever with us. Amen. Tommy, do I remember that that was often put on people's shields? That that prayer would be when soldiers would go into battle? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, it's known as the breastplate prayer. Okay, that's what it was here. Because I was like, I knew it. Because it's one of those where this stuff is all connected. We think all these things through. (laughs) Like, all of this is connected. Um, also, a reminder that Chris is here uh, as, we, as we prayed that she will stay after church with you. If you have a prayer concern or a prayer joy uh, that you want to share with her, she will pray with you. You can also contact the staff all week long. Uh, we offer up prayers all throughout the week uh, so that you know that you are covered in it. Um, so this is our time of invitation Uh, where we invite people, if they want to join the church, become a member of this community, or if they want to make their confession of faith for the first time, if they want uh, Christ all around them as well in their lives moving forward, um, we invite you to do that as we sing. And I invite you because it slays giants. I mean, it sounds hard, but we do it together. I also love this idea that, you know, we, we are told all the time, oh, if we're not big, then we're not good. Like, no, 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 God loves small God loves little. God values that the most. God loves vulnerable, Jerry. God loves to be loved by the things that we do. And you are invited to understand that you are already enough. You're not too little. You're not, your faith's not too small. It's more than enough. Come be enough here with the rest of us. And may you always hear that call. May you always hear that you are enough. May you always hear that you already have the stones you need to slay the giants.
With that, with that, let us stand and sing our closing song, Goodness, Love, and Mercy. know how you can go into the week in a bad mood listening to our band. I just don't understand it. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> I just don't think it's possible. Matt and I talked about that earlier. So I have a couple of announcements. We have a lot of stuff going on. First off, today, the Rumors, Jerry's band, is playing tonight for free in Prospect. There's information about that in the bulletin. Food trucks start this week. Yes. Celtic Pig, yeah, I know. Celtic Pig is coming. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to come. We've got your Wednesday nights covered for dinner for the next six weeks, other than Fourth of July. So please join us for that. Everybody was excellent at inviting people at the yard sale. Oh yeah, and I have to. So yard sale was awesome, y'all. Uh, I was able to order very good weather right up until the end. 
for us. Uh, we know that the kids made $109.50 from donuts, and we know that the church made $335 and got rid of a bunch of our stuff <laughs> that we didn't need uh, and that other people will benefit. I know somebody's uh, wedding now has all of their bud vases covered uh, because of us, so we're grateful for that, and I'm just so grateful for the people who showed up and set up. It was a well-oiled machine. It was beautifully done, as so many things here are, uh, by our lay leaders, so I'm grateful for all of that, and it was a lovely morning to spend together, so there's that. And then a reminder, as Jerry said, we're going to go to the Kentucky Refugee Ministry Volunteer Day is on June 23rd. It's going to be a blast, but it only works if you tell him he, he has not mastered mental telepathy yet. He doesn't know if you're thinking about it. You have to tell him that you're going to go. So if you can do that this week, because I don't think you want to miss it. We got to go to Water Step last year, and it was really powerful. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Oh, exciting stuff is happening. But I'm going to leave you with this blessing. You worship a living God. You worship a God who delivers and a God who is living with you and in you and among you. Take that good news with you. It is all you need and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Amen.